Hi guys and welcome, Lincoln Wright here. Today I'd like to show you how I painted my custom K2SO, starting off with this and then using this small selection of paints to get it looking like this. Okay, let's go. Here's a very quick overview of the seven steps I'd like to take you through in this video. First off, I'd like to share with you how I set up for airbrush work. Thank you for the questions about how I set up my workspace. I'm very happy to share with you. First things first, you've got to have an extraction booth when dealing with atomized paints. Here's what I'm using, this really awesome setup from Sparmax. Organic filter mask and eye protection. Here's the airbrush I'm using, a Sparmax Max series. I took a photo here so I would show you exactly the right one, not get it wrong. And here's my compressor, uh, Airism, also from Sparmax. Why is everything Sparmax? Well, when I came back to Australia, I got everything uh, set up as one deal and uh, they make stuff OEM for other famous brands that I can't say, but uh, they make really good stuff. I like them a lot. Next step, priming with the spray can. Here I am using one of my favorites, it's a Tamiya Fine Surface uh, Primer. And the reason I like this one so much is that it's both for plastic and metal. Uh, some of them don't have a metal etching component in them, so, and this makes it really easy, you just need the one, right? Uh, I'll do this in two different ways. Uh, if I'm just outside and it's not too windy, um, you've seen me do it in previous videos, I'll just lay down some cardboard boxes and spray like that. In this case, because I'm setting up for, for subsequent steps with, a, uh, with an airbrush, I've got my booth and everything set up, so I'll do it like this. It just makes it nice, simple, and quick. Uh, I went with gray in this instance because, as you can see, I was planning to go with white, and um, the gray is a good middle step down in going from the very dark plastic to what will eventually be a very bright color. I understand you might have questions at this stage if you're setting up for airbrush use, why aren't you just priming it with an airbrush? And the very simple reason is, at this moment, I don't have something in gray that would be suitable for priming this. I did think about testing out ammo one shot. I have heard and read and asked friends that they say you can spray lacquers over the top of it, but just in case it didn't work, I didn't want to test it out this time. But that is something that we could test together in a future video. Please let me know if you'd like to see that and we can plan that into our content releases. Just let me know in the comments below. Nice and easy with this, you can see I'm doing very short, brief mist coats on. A little bit heavier than mist, but I'm doing it nice and gently and uh, I'm not rushing this at all. When you're using rattle cans, a lot of paint does come out very quickly. Please do take your time. It's easier to quickly, you know, spray on a couple more light coats than it is to strip it back or sandpaper it back. That takes a lot more time. Here he is. K2SO resplendent in primer. Next up, airbrushing Mr. Color Character White. I went with Character White because it's off-white, semi-gloss, and it's got a really cool sort of grayish tech tinge to it that I thought would look really good for the Imperials. Now, here's a really, this is a quick and dirty shot off my workbench because I thought I could share with you guys how I prepare stuff for airbrushing. It's a pretty simple procedure, but I, uh, and, and I use a minimum of tools and I thought you might like it. So I give the, the paint a really good mix. Um, this is my Wave paint stirrer. And you know, if you've seen a video before, you'll know I'm always talking about these things. I use the paint stirrer itself after, uh, after giving it a good whiz to, uh, to pour down and along. Now, sorry, it was a bit windy when I was filming this and I was having a bit of a laugh to myself thinking, yeah, that's great quality footage right there. Um, yeah, thanks, Link. Now, here you'll see one of the things that, uh, it's one of my trademarks in using the, uh, the, the prepared shaker bottle of uh, lacquer thinner here and I use it for everything and it's a real time saver. I use it also when I'm airbrushing to fill up little bottles like this. I haven't used measurements here, but I generally put it in to a ratio of about say one to four paint to thinner. And I find that works pretty well for most of these Japanese lacquer paints. If anything, I'll over thin them because it's easy to drop a little bit more paint in than it is if you find out your, your uh, mix is too thick and uh, it, it spider webs on you. So just that that's how I like to do it. And I like in this case that it actually does look like milk. You know, you're always told to make it look like milk before you airbrush it. There you go. Alrighty, finally, we're gonna do some airbrushing. Now, I've had the little plan in my mind because I've used gray here that I can do a subtle pre-shade effect. Now, pre-shading, it's not a big deal whether you do it before or after. Uh, in fact, I think post-shading is probably easier and uh, you can control your effect more 
but because I was using white and because I haven't done it for a long time, you know, it's kind of a whim thing. When you make lots of models, I like to uh, experiment and use different things. Now you can see that the paint mix I made was very, very thin. So I'm putting it on very, th <laughs> very thinly. I'm, I'm spraying it on very carefully. Uh, because it's thin, I don't want it to run. Uh, it would be easy to blast it on. And I find with airbrushing, I won't rush as much as I do with, uh, with hand brushing. With hand brushing, I'm very confident to just lather the paint on and deal with it later. With airbrushing, you kind of can't do that as much because it is difficult to, you know, control Z, command Z, and, and, and repair any mistakes you make. So uh, I tend to build it up in very thin layers, and, and that's playing to the strength of an airbrush too. An airbrush does give you control to do multiple very nice thin layers, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm building up carefully, very strategically, I'm spraying first into the middle of areas and leaving a little bit of gray on the outside and uh, gradually building up a good thickness of paint here. Uh, there's no hurry. It's nice eating though. This isn't hard duty. Um, and it is kind of fun and relaxing. So uh, I, I quite like this. This kind of airbrush job I really do like to do as well. Um, and it does look cool as it becomes white. And uh, you know that beautiful quality of finish that an airbrush gives you, it is fun to do. I will admit that. Now, I imagine as you're watching this, you're thinking to yourself, Hey, Uncle Link, how come there's dark plastic bits showing through here? You know, what kind of uh, crappy primer job did you do here? What are you showing us? Well, I promise I did it for a reason. I wanted to show you that uh, I don't always reprimer the model uh, after I've done the cleanup from the construction process. Uh, you can, that's fine to do it. But if you're using a lacquer paint like this, you can actually just go straight to your color coat stage. Cool, right? Now the reason for that is that all lacquer paints have an etching component, so uh, the chemically they can attach to the plastic really well, so you can go straight on. So that then logically will lead you to the next question, could I have sprayed white directly onto this without the primer coat? Yes, I could. The next question then would be, so why did you do it? Well, the main thing was that it was very difficult to spot where the imperfections were on the kit when it was in dark gray plastic, dark black plastic. So uh, I would have had a lot of trouble seeing it. When I did the interim uh, step of gray, uh, I was able to spot it because they would have been highly visible with the white finish. So I saved myself some extra cleanup by putting in an extra step. Funny, right? Next, let's airbrush Ammo by Mig Orange. Okay, suspense immediately out of the way. This is the third time for me to experiment uh, airbrushing with Ammo by Mig Acrylics, and I finally got it right. It's actually really easy. All I did was follow MIG's tutorial. <laughs> and it really is that simple. Instead of trying to reinvent it, I followed what MIG did in his how to airbrush uh, his acrylics. And uh, it goes really simple. I've seen quite a few replies on uh, Facebook where uh, people were talking about thinning ratios, air pressure, etc. I mean, they play some small role, but it's very small because you can, you can airbrush this stuff straight from the bottle. It, it airbrushes just fine. Uh, I tried it at higher pressure and lower pressure, again, just fine. So they're not so important as going very slowly. Because it's not using a solvent, there's nothing to break the surface tension of water. So what you need to do is go very slowly, build up very light coats gradually, and uh, it, then it works beautifully. I was actually really super impressed with the finish of this stuff, and it was just by doing it correctly this time. Now spraying in very small sections, uh, you can see it's gradually building up. I let it dry in between, and uh, I moved around the piece and built it up. Just, that's really it. So look out, my conversion to Acrylicist is now complete. Next up, detail painting with Mr. Color Gundam MS Grey. Hey, do you remember way back when you and I were talking about airbrushing lacquer paints and that uh, I mentioned that you could use them as a primer, like about three minutes ago? I also wanted to show you that you can use them as a hand brush primer as well. Just say you have some details and uh, you want to put them onto something that's difficult, very difficult to mask, difficult to use the airbrush, you can whip out your hand painting brush and, uh, and, and put them on there straight onto the plastic and they're more than, more than fine. So I've got a dish here. I like these little ceramic dishes. I buy them from the local supermarket for like a dollar. 
Here's the shaker bottle that I used to uh, pour out the thinner, and I showed you that in the airbrush step as well. One of the coolest things about lacquer paints is that they never cure. So as soon as you, you put thinner back into them, they reactivate and they have exactly the same awesome properties and performance that they had the first time you used them. Okay, so why doesn't everybody use them? Because they smell very bad and they're toxic. For real. Be very careful when you're using these things. I make sure I've got windows open or I'm outside and I have very good cross flow ventilation. I'm super careful. I'm a professional, so I'm using them all the time. I'm super careful with them. I almost always will put a little bit out with the paint I'm reactivating. It's a time saving thing. It takes a little bit of time for the paint underneath it to reactivate and be ready to use. So as I start using the fresh paint I've added into the dish, by the time I'm getting to the bottom of that, usually the paint underneath it is reactivated enough that I'm back in business. See me testing the, the, uh, the paint consistency out against the side of the dish here? This uh, is another, it's kind of a time-saving uh, trick or hack. I can um, see how thick the paint is uh, before throwing it on the model. I get a really good idea of my consistency that way. And uh, if it's too thin, like you saw it there, it, it goes back very nicely back into the middle of the dish so, uh, and that's where it keeps it reactivated with the, uh, with the thinner. So uh, I wouldn't use this stuff on a, uh, a flat palette because um, it'll spread out. The uh, low surface tension of it means it'll spread out too quickly. These dishes are ideal for this kind of work. Because these paints are also working as a primer, you can see I'm putting it straight onto this part, uh, this detail part. I can put it on without another layer. But please do remember, this paint is quite toxic. You must have excellent ventilation to do this technique. All right, now let's do some detail painting with Ammo by Mig Acrylic. Much as I love the lack of paints, there are issues with them. The toxicity is most, most important. So let's try something new. I've been looking for a way to replicate that kind of performance with acrylics, and I think I've found something pretty close. We've tested this stuff before together through an airbrush, so, you know, I thought, why not? Let's see if it hand brushes. And the very quick takeaway is that it does, and it's amazing. Now with this lid, do be a bit careful. Uh, when you pop it open, it can spray. Uh, it's good for dripping it out like this, but uh, opening and closing it, do be careful. I can't say how impressed I am with this stuff, you know, enough. So uh, medium sized soft brush here. Uh, I've pre-dipped it in water. This uh, stuff does thin with water. Uh, and uh, it's right to go straight out of the bottle. You could see the, the brush wasn't, wasn't very wet, so I didn't need to, to thin it much. And I've just tested it out. Uh, there's some overspray. I had taped up the joints with uh, Tamiya uh, tape, uh, the yellow one, right? So um, going back over it here, there's a couple of places, places that have both overspray and it's uh, semi-gloss, which, you know, traditionally that can be difficult to paint over with water-based acrylics because uh, they tend to, uh, to break up and not stick. But uh, this stuff is, is, uh, is bully, bully, sir. It, uh, it goes straight over it. So um, there are a couple of places on the back of the knee here, etc. where I'm painting now that it was, um, you know, just bare plastic. And it was soft, uh, flexible Bandai plastic too, which is difficult again to stick with, stick on. So uh, if it was just the straight color ones, the airbrush paints, I don't think it would have worked as well. But working around the model here, using this stuff, uh, I put it on in quite liberal wet coats and uh, it went on beautifully, it stuck, it hasn't flaked off yet, and uh, I've tried flexing the joints backwards and forwards. So, you know, super impressed. This is going into the Uncle Link, uh, you know, repertoire from now on. Definitely give this one a go. I think I might be replacing a bunch of the, uh, the lacquer hand painting steps that I was doing before, because, uh, you know, no smell, no fumes. This is really good stuff. Giving you a very quick close up of it here, and uh, this is painting over the semi-gloss overspray and the bare, uh, you know, bendy plastic, the, the Bandai plastic in the middle. As you can see, it's going over very well. Now, it was, um, it's not as powerful as lacquer, you know, thank, thank goodness, uh, for, you know, for good reasons also. But uh, in a couple of spots, it needed, uh, say, two coats. But as a trade-off for uh, having no fumes, though, I, uh, I'm happy to do that. Hope you like this little hack I've shared with you. Uh, I'm I see this being super useful for uh, for modeling projects from now on. For the uh, the actual color of the joints, I wanted something that was you know obviously metallic and a slight tinge, a brownish orange tinge to match up with the shoulder. I couldn't decide, so I tested both of these out. 
Okay, now forgive me the name dropping, but I need to, to make some sort of reference and, uh, and, and explain these because um, I've had some other friends trying these paints off my recommendation and uh, many of them are surprised at first. And uh, I get that. Um, you've seen that I've done quite a few models with them. So uh, my background was uh, with acrylics. Started out with Citadel, with Games Workshop. Uh, I was really into uh, uh, making models for wargaming more than the wargaming itself. But, uh, but I loved both aspects of it. And, um, and then Vallejo, because Vallejo uh, became really popular with people wanting to, uh, to upgrade from Citadel. It's not actually a better paint, but it's better for beginners in some ways. Because of the opacity, you can get very quick uh, results with Vallejo. So switching over to the Ammo by MIG paints, I was expecting you know, the same thing in a different bottle. I'll be honest. I mean, come on, we're all thinking the same thing, right? But they're not. They are actually very different. And I didn't want to come out and say that too quickly until I'd done appropriate field testing, which means, you know, not just looking at it and armchairing it, but making a bunch of models with them. And uh, this is number, what, you know, four or five. So, you know, I've given them a really good test. I've airbrushed them, I've hand painted them. I did the camo on the uh, on the polar bear. I've really given them a, a, a good run, and uh, they're different. So, uh, but yes, I'm finding them now. They are worth the time investment to figure them out. And I think that's that's the most important thing. That doesn't get said enough in reviews on paints and products, does it? That um, anything we use for the first time when it's new, you're not going to be really good with it straight off the bat, are you? Even me, as a professional sci-fi painting you know, modeler, um, I require a bit of time to get up to speed with things. Uh, the first time I airbrushed them was a, you know, I had a, <laughs> had a couple of uh, not so great moments, and uh, even hand brushing them, you know, there was a couple of WTF moments too, right? But I pressed on, and uh, I'm doing really well with them. I quite like them now. So, uh, actually back to the tutorial, the guide, here I am, I'm, I'm, uh, this is basically base coating. You know, if you're coming from Games Workshop or doing the other things, this is just base coating. And uh, the gunmetal, it wasn't dark enough for me. It, it, it's, it's a really nice looking color, but it wasn't right for me. Uh, working with the orange and the white, uh, my little model paint knives just said to me, nah, that's not right. So I went with the, uh, the burnt iron one, and it's a really cool look. Oh, and apologies for not pointing this out previously, but uh, the reason I'm doing this, uh, if you're going to paint metallics like this, uh, black undercoat looks much better than white. Uh, and then it's kind of a, it's a light overbrush of the uh, metallic color that you want. It's a very easy process. Alrighty, last chapter, decals made easy. Decals or water slides. Bandai have included both options in these Star Wars kits, water slide decals and stickers. Now, if you go to all of the trouble of painting it, I highly recommend that you use the water slides because they uh, they go on and, and just look much better. Now, very simply, uh, I cut them out. I uh, use some nice craft scissors like this. These happen to be the specific Tamiya ones uh, for, for cutting out decals. I've got a small dish here of just tap water. With a soft brush, I submerge it. Uh, sometimes they'll just float on the surface and it doesn't get them uh, wet properly. And uh, I leave them for, say, 30 seconds or so until I get some other products ready. In this case, I'm going to use Mr. Mark Setter. Now, depending on where you are, uh, you can have different ones available to you. Uh, my two go-tos are Mr. Mark Setter or Microset, the uh, blue one. There's not much in it. Uh, I did a test video uh, comparing both of them and uh, you can find that on my channel. I'll put a link uh, in the comments below so you can check that out as well. But performance for them is, uh, differences are negligible. They're both very good. I tend to use this one just because the bottle is less tippy and uh, it's easier to, uh, to to use when shooting a video. But uh, And it's got that nice brush applicator built into it. So it, this is a pretty good one. I'd say it's my favorite. Okay, I purposely let this run uh, so you could see, I haven't cut this, that's exactly how long I had it in the water and that was long enough. That will slide off uh, very easily now. Ready? Let's, come on Link. Don't fail me now. Move, move, wet it, and yes, it's sliding on the backing paper. Can you imagine how embarrassing that would have been if that didn't come off? <laughs> Here I wanted to show you that uh, Mr. Mark said uh, uh, it has sediment, it has like a component in it that settles to the bottom. Uh, so I do give it a shake uh, almost every time before I use it. Make sure you put the lid back on properly because, you know, I'm not saying I've ever done that, but I did. So <laughs> make sure that lid's on before you give it a good shake, okay? Boom, and done. You saw how easy that was. Well, the whole time I was babbling, I did it uh, whilst babbling. So 
Uh, it's a very simple process. You uh, you get a little bit of that uh, the solution on that helps to to, uh, to 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 seat properly on the surface, um, and then I slide it. Just slide it off the backing paper. Then with the soft brush, I uh, move it into position. Now I uh, I wasn't checking the um, you know the instructions of the box art. I actually did place it too low. Once I noticed that, I uh, put some more of the solution over the top, and it makes it very easy to slide across the uh, the surface of the. Uh, of the piece. Very quick word on gloss coats, I use this, Mr. Super Clear, a quick shot before and after to seal the decal in. I get my Star Wars kits, paints and tools from my local hobby shop, Hobbyco. And let's do our part, support local and check them out. If you're also in Australia, get your local hobby shop to contact Ryan at Hobbyco and they will get Star Wars in for you. Cool, right? Huge shout out to my top patron supporters, Ivan, MB, Grant, Con, Simon and Robert. Thanks guys. And an extra special shout out to the Paint on Plastic patron community who make these videos happen. Thanks guys.